Data is food for models, but today it takes a long time to make a meal. So although we have this great modeling technology, we're still using data sets that were created 10 years ago. When we set out to create new data sets, it's still a massive effort that requires a long time, a lot of people, and the resources of large tech companies. In ML Commons, we've set out to answer, how can we make this much easier and much more accessible to a larger community? How can we make it accessible to an academic community? This is what we've learned so far. About seven years ago, I realized that deep learning was about to take off and I joined Baidu's new AI lab. And we built a system that was called Deep Speech. And Deep Speech taught me the importance of keeping a model well-fed. When I joined during my first week, we had no frameworks. We had an implementation of the model written in MATLAB um, that could run on a small amount of data on a laptop. And we had multiple challenges. We, it took a long time to write the models that we wanted. We didn't have frameworks. So we had to build frameworks. Um, and I started building a framework. And we also started building a cluster uh, so that we could uh, scale up to larger models and uh, train on larger data sets. So while I was uh, helping build the framework and the cluster to run deep speech, we also had hired some of uh, Feifei Li's students who had built ImageNet. And they started doing something different. They started essentially collecting uh, data, collecting training data and labeling training data. So they set out um, to build a large new speech data set from scratch um, that we could use to train deep speech. And this figure shows the impact of their data collection efforts. So um, over just a few months, you know, we went from practically having no data, um, we started to having uh, several thousand hours of labeled data collected. Um, and you can just see the error rate of the system. You know, as we added more data, we would train our models on that you know, additional data. And you can see the error rate just plummeting um, as we added more data. And so the, I realized there's no data like more data. Um, there's no data like more training data for large uh, deep learning supervised learning models. Um, and the biggest impact, the thing, you know, more than, uh, of course, you know, we actually had to write a, a functional implementation. We had, the code had to work. It had to run fast enough to train a model and all that data. Um, but more than any idea, more than any uh, new model, more than any new technology, um, the thing that improved the quality of the system the most um, was having the right training data set. And so it, it taught me that um, in addition to models and in addition to systems that can, that can run those models, uh, machine learning solutions need data sets. They strongly depend on data in a way that most software uh, that I had dealt with before didn't. Um, most software that, that I'd seen before you could um, build it just with a team of engineers uh, and they would write code, you know, and they would run it on systems and you wouldn't really need data. Um, you know, maybe you need a little bit of data, but um, for the most part, you know, the, these systems were about code and the computers that the code would run on. And deep speech taught me that this is fundamentally different. Um, if you're missing data, uh, you know, if you have the code and the model without the right data, then you're essentially starving the model and starving the system. If data sets are like food, then ImageNet has been feeding the community um, for the last decade. And it's been incredibly successful in doing that. It spawned um, you know, many new technologies that are built on top of it, including MLPerf, uh, including deep learning, including ResNets, including NMT attention. Um, and when we look at uh, usage of data sets in papers, um, in machine learning papers, we find um, the overwhelming majority are using uh, open data sets like ImageNet um, because they are accessible. We, we know of a lot of production systems that are using uh, large similar data sets that are uh, deployed in big internet companies, but um, those uh, data sets are um, locked away from the rest of the world. When we're bringing up new machine learning uh, solutions, we often find that there are three major components, um, three major tasks that have to be accomplished to uh, deploy any machine learning solution in production at scale. Um, so one is, you know, we need to create a data set. 
Uh, we need to do engineering work to actually uh, create a, a useful supervised learning data set like ImageNet. Um, and we look back, we did a case study and interviewed a lot of the ImageNet creators. We found that you know, there's a lot of advanced technology that went into that, including search technology, crowdsourcing technology, uh, data quality um, technology. And uh, although it was actually very efficient, like the original projections for ImageNet using manual labeling would have taken decades, um, the team got it done in a short amount of time in you know, a few years, less than 10 years. Um, uh, but it still took a long time. Uh, but once you've created a data set like that, um, then you can actually move on to modeling. And we've built some amazing modeling technology. So um, in MLPerf, uh, recent submissions have shown that it's possible to train advanced models like ResNet 50 um, in less than 30 seconds on the entire ImageNet data set uh, using frameworks like TensorFlow and specialized computing clusters like TPU clusters. And then finally, once we've trained um, the model that we're happy with, uh, we need to actually deploy it at scale. And uh, for, for example, um, personal assistants like uh, Alexa, Google Home, Siri, uh, reach hundreds of millions to billions of users. And so actually pushing out the models and then making them um, uh, run in real time, uh, fitting in the performance constraints of edge devices is, is an enormous effort. Um, making sure that quality is maintained you know, across a very large number of users is, is a huge effort. So we, we um, can do deployments out to billions of people, but uh, it takes um, the, the operational aspect of doing this is quite significant and it's currently taken on usually by big internet companies. Um, so these are the uh, stages of the machine learning life cycle that um, most, of, most of these products will have to go through and get into production. Um, I want to focus here on data engineering because I think data engineering has been neglected. Um, while we have, you know, specialized systems like TPUs and productive frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, for writing models, um, we're really stuck in the stone ages for data engineering. Um, most of the time when we're building new data sets, you know, we do have technologies like crowdsourcing, um, but many uh, teams that I've, that I've found, even in industry, they will build their own in-house tools, which are never shared publicly. Um, or they will uh, just be in the stone ages of, you know, they'll start from Python or they'll start from the operating system or the file system uh, to organize their data, or they'll try and put, um, you know, image or visual uh, data or, or data used for supervised learning into a system that was designed to store relational data. Um, and so, you know, the, these uh, tools, we, we, although we have great um, frameworks uh, and systems for supporting models, uh, for supervised deep learning, we really don't have anything for data sets. So we recently went through a new case study uh, to try and create a new data set um, based on what we've learned so far. So uh, in ML Commons, uh, we started out and attempted to rebuild essentially deep speech in the public domain. So we already knew that um, it was possible to build deep speech, but deep speech had been built as an internal project. Um, and so uh, because uh, the data that was collected was, was through an internal pipeline, um, it was not possible and there were, no, there were no licenses that were compatible with releasing that data set publicly. Um, so in the people speech in ML Commons, we asked the question, uh, could we create a large data set of the scale of uh, speech data set of the scale of deep speech um, that's purely in the public domain, um, where all the, da the data has a, a license that's compatible with um, posting it directly on the internet um, and that allows academic and commercial reuse. So we went through this project last year and we managed to collect about 86,000 hours of public labeled speech. This is about um, almost 100 times bigger than the largest uh, uh, previous data set at the time. Um, and along the way, we discovered that there's actually, uh, because, because of organizations like Creative Commons, there's actually a large amount of Creative Commons licensed data available on the internet. Um, so you know, certainly not all data on the internet uh, is uh, covered under permissive license like Creative Commons, but a substantial amount of it is. Um, we labeled the 86,000 hours 
and there's far more than that uh, that we found. Um, we found, you know, uh, stopped counting after about 10 million hours. Um, so there's more than 10 million hours of uh, Creative Commons labeled data on the internet. Um, actually, labeling all that data is an enormous challenge. So we, we used a technology that's called forced alignment um, to make it uh, scalable, uh, cheap, um, to actually uh, extract labeled data, you know, just, just off of um, unfiltered uh, data available on the internet. And uh, we were able to use a TPU cluster to um, perform forced alignment and then train models on, on this data to make sure that the quality was good, that it, when we train models on, on the data that was collected, the, the models would be high quality. Um, but we realized when, when we were doing this that um, there's some significant gaps in you know, what kind of uh, technology is available to create data sets like this. Um, so one is the problem of controlling what goes into the data set. Uh, so when we ran a crawler over uh, Creative Commons content on the internet, um, we found mostly English audiobooks. And so it's certainly better than nothing, um, but it's heavily biased towards English. The figure here shows um, the relative size in terms of number of speakers of different languages in the world. Um, so it should make it clear that uh, there are actually over a thousand languages with over a million native speakers. So English covers you know, some part of uh, the user base, but um, it actually quite a lot of it is not covered um, by English audiobooks. So, you know, in, in addition to that, um, audiobooks are well known to be in controlled environments, and so the environments are not realistic. Um, you know, it's focusing on you know a single type of speech application of uh, transcription application. In fact, there are multiple uh, valuable applications, including audio enhancement, uh, speech to text, and uh, keyword spotting and use in um, medical applications and, and multiple others, including um, far field diarization, so there's a lot of applications that are not covered um, by English audiobooks. Um, so one challenge that we have is uh, how can we actually, you know, through an approach like this, uh, control what goes into our data set. If we wanted to build a Spanish data set, um, how could we do that? How could we direct um, you know, this uh, data collection effort to, to focus on Spanish rather than English. Um, whereas what we currently did was we just sampled essentially randomly off of the internet. Um, uh, this was also a significant effort. So if we look at the time required for our uh, team of volunteers to label 86,000 hours of speech, it took us about one year. We think we're actually very efficient. We um, originally thought it would take much longer than this, especially if we paid people to speak or pay people to label uh, data like this. So, you know, technologies like forced alignment and TPU clusters made it easier and faster to create this data set. Um, but one year is still a long time to create a data set for one model. Um, and, you know, it's certainly a lot longer than it takes us to bring up new models. Uh, so one open problem that we recognize here is how we can cut this down significantly. How could we you know, make creating data sets like this, like the people speech, like deep speech, like ImageNet, um, or for recommendation like Critio, um, how could we make creating data sets like that as easy as it is currently to train models? And so, um, you know, looking at these case studies, uh, we're trying, uh, we're starting to put together the outline of a system or a framework for creating data sets. We want to start with speech. And so what could a data framework, a framework focusing on creating food, you know, quickly or a fast food uh, framework for our data sets look like? What would this look like? So the first part um, we've realized is that it's important to be able to control what goes into the data set. Um, so, you know, we'd like some human readable specification uh, of what should be included in the data set or some human readable specification of the task that the data set is going to um, enable. So uh, one um, task that we've been interested in uh, from a speech data set perspective is covering more languages. Um, so being able to build accurate speech recognition models quickly uh, in many languages, not just in uh, English or, or Mandarin, like the most, the most common languages. Um, so uh, for example, you can imagine specifying the data set as um, sh it should include a thousand words, at least 1,000, maybe the 1,000 most frequent words 
um, spread across 1,000 different languages. Uh, so this is one you know, example of a um, specification for a data set. Um, so with that specification, then we want to use uh, technologies that automate the collection and labeling of that data set. So um, we use search technologies. Uh, when we're looking at this from a um, ML Commons lens, we would look at uh, the Creative Commons license content or the public domain uh, content that is available. Um, you know, available from multiple sources. And you know, certainly uh, Creative Commons content on the internet uh, is the largest source that we're aware of. Um, but there's a lot of data out there. Some of it is uh, garbage. Some of it um, is, is quite relevant, um, uh, but it may not uh, actually match the task. So um, the idea is here is to use search technology uh, to be able to focus um, the crawling uh, collection ingestion um, of Creative Commons web data uh, based on the specification um, in the data book. Okay, so that would um, essentially identify a lot of data that could be uh, a canon for a data set. And so the second piece, um, the second part of this pipeline is focusing on um, preparing it for uh, training a machine learning model. Um, so in speech recognition, it turns out that there's this um, clever uh, technology that's called uh, forced alignment, um, which essentially can use a weak speech recognition model um, to solve an easier problem. So if you have uh, speech and then you have some text um, located nearby the speech, so maybe this is a caption that's already provided, maybe this is a book, maybe this is a description um, of a web page and there's a video, you know, for example, like the words out of this presentation compared to my recording of it, um, you could uh, try using the force alignment algorithm to match the audio with the text. Um, and so some pieces will be uh, good matches um, and some pieces will not. And it turns out that the forced alignment problem is just easier than the speech to text problem. Um, and so even if you don't have a great uh, speech to text model, um, you can do very well uh, on the forced alignment, uh, basically producing a data set you know, that can then be used to train a speech to text model. Um, so forced alignment is a way of uh, taking raw unfiltered content um, on the internet and in a very scalable automated way um, labeling it. Uh, now, uh, just like um, you know, speech to text is not going to be perfectly accurate even with a very good model, uh, forced alignment is not going to be perfect even with a very good model. Um, and so we would still want uh, quality checks. So we'd like uh, automated quality checks um, to uh, further filter the data, uh, further verify the labels, um, and could involve human effort. Um, the challenge in, in quality, uh, data quality, is, is um, uh, trading off between the actual quality, which is best if, um, you know, this is done by a single, you know, the single best human, um, but is more scalable if it is more automated. So if you use technologies like um, additional filters, additional models to, to do filtering or crowdsourcing, um, or different additional types of essentially assertions or machine learning assertions, um, this is more scalable than uh, uh, than you know, a, a few highly skilled humans. Um, so there's a trade-off in quality between scale uh, and then the human investment required. Um, and then finally, once you've uh, labeled all of your data and it's at an uh, acceptable quality level, um, then you can export it and package it and format it, uh, essentially distribute it to all of the um, models that you'd like to uh, train uh, that are downstream. Um, so you'd like to be able to, uh, to export this in a format that can be very easily plugged into uh, and, and used to train new speech, um, speech models. Looking back, you know, we, we learned that data is food for models. As we saw case studies of uh, ImageNet, deep speech, and the people's speech um, creating food. And we realized that uh, food is, you know, we actually can create uh, valuable supervised learning data sets like this but it's really slow. And so we can create food, but it's really slow. So what we really need is fast food. We need to make the um, data creation process much faster. Um, so we looked at how this fits into the machine learning life cycle and some pieces of the machine learning life cycle, especially modeling has uh, benefited from systems technologies, including frameworks, uh, programming systems, and including uh, hardware systems, including uh, accelerators and um, distributed systems, high-performance distributed systems. 
um, like TPU clusters. Um, but data sets really don't have uh, frameworks or hardware or specialized um, accelerators or, or distributed systems. And we have distributed file systems, but uh, you know, we're, we're missing um, specialization layers that um, make it much easier to build um, uh, things like these case studies of ImageNet, Deep Speech, or the People's Speech. Um, and so the, we, we also talked about what such a uh, fast data framework could look like or a fast food framework could look like. So what would um, a system that reduces the time to create a data set like this to the greatest extent possible, the effort you know, to create a data set like this to the greatest extent possible look like? Um, so we saw one view on that. If you're passionate about this topic, um, please reach out to us and you know, we're an open community organization. We'd welcome new contributors.